So it might not feel like it, but the Blue Jays are right in the thick of a playoff hunt right now. Winning yesterday, backs against the wall. I know it wasn't the prettiest win against Oakland, the bottom-feeding athletics. But you know what? Sometimes the old adage, a win is a win, comes to mind. And that really is something to hang the hat on when it comes to what has just transpired over the last week, which is the Blue Jays went from two and a half games back of the wild card and now sit half a game back of the Texas Rangers, a game and a half back of the Houston Astros and a game and a half back of the Seattle Mariners. They have gained ground. They they are in it. And there's all sorts of reasons to be disparaging, but I'm going to come out and say right now, Adam, I don't give a shit. This team is right in the thick of it. And I'm going to enjoy September baseball, even if some other fans are freaking out around me. I, I get it. This this is a flawed lineup, but buddy, I'm pretty excited. I'm going I'm with to you. enjoy it. I'm with you. Uh, this is kind of mailbag related, uh, but my dad likes the magic number. We mm-hmm. talked about magic number on Friday's episode. Now that we're into September, mm-hmm. Blue Jays magic number on Friday was 32 with 28 games remaining. Now we have 24 games remaining and our magic number down to 26. So we yes. made up some serious ground. Uh, Astros beat on the uh, Rangers. Rangers continue to lose, which is great. Rangers I don't think... continue to lose. And honestly, even Houston has not looked it's like swept the, by the Yankees beating Houston that we're expecting to see. And everyone keeps picking the Astros as maybe the best team in the American League. I don't know at this point. It wouldn't shock me if they fell out of this thing as well. Like they, the Blue Jays, the Rangers, and the Astros over the last month have honestly given none of their fan bases a reason to dig their heels in and be like, this team has it made. They keep giving each other chances too to bury the other team. Nobody's (laughs) taking advantage of it. And we're just in a scenario right now, whereas Toronto Blue Jays fans, we just got to see how this unfolds. The final... Wild card spot in the American League is probably going to hold 87 to 88 wins. They're going to be the Philadelphia Phillies of last year. Almost Which certainly right. Yeah. That's... Is kind of fine. So, hello, everybody. This is the walk off. I'm Scott Belford, joined as always by the best co host in the biz, Adam Mack. This is a Monday morning mailbag on a Tuesday afternoon. Most of you know the trick here, which is every single week we comb through through all the interactions of you, the grounds crew, and we kind of answer your questions and comments. Now, to get your comments in, all you need to do, drop those into the YouTube. You can also reach out by DM on Twitter at Walk Off Podcast and on Instagram, the Walk Off Podcast. We comb through the Discord as well, which is a happening place. Now, there are some changes going on with Discord. However, we are going to get to that in the meantime. You can place your comments there. And Patreon, you get that Patreon bump. And you get priority with your comments. We do tackle every single Patreon comment. Or at least we have been able to so far. Our Patreon does continue to grow. So as that continues to grow, it might get harder and harder. But right now, you have that instant access uh allow me to just read the official statement from the walk-off podcast uh in regards to the patreon and the discord as we move the discord to a patreon exclusive perk next month i'm not good at reading especially in public so wish me luck okay so I did uh, put this post in the Discord. I tagged everyone, but maybe you haven't seen it yet. Uh, So if you haven't, uh, here you go. Uh, We are making Discord a Patreon exclusive perk starting next month. So October 1st. Uh, We hope you all understand that this isn't a choice we've made to greedily limit anyone's access. Uh, The fact is the current everything is free for everyone model is just not sustainable. And if we don't make changes, 
then everyone will lose out on the show, the guest interviews, the community, uh, when we're forced to end it entirely and walk away from this whole project. Uh, we are making these changes to hopefully keep the walk-off alive. Uh, this will mean that some of you will get less content and less community here uh, than you have been getting for the past three years. But if we don't make this change, then everyone will get zero content very soon, very soon. Uh, we know that many of you have developed friendships uh, through this Discord community, and that's genuinely awesome. Honestly, Scott and I message constantly about how uh, heartwarming it is to see uh, the community grow there. Uh, the we, rec best, actually. we recognize that $1 a week to remain in our Discord may not be possible for some of you once it becomes a Patreon perk. And Scott and I do not wish to end any of your friendships with this move. So that is why we're giving you a full month of notice for this change. That way, if you really connected with somebody and you want to keep in touch and keep chatting with them about the Blue Jays, but you can't afford $1 a week, we get it. But now the onus is on you. DM that person directly. Shoot them a message in Discord for free while it's free. Get their phone number, their email, add each other on Facebook, Snapchat, whatever. That way you can keep those friendships going for free mm -hmm. if that's how you wish to proceed. Um, but yes, access to the walk off discord server will become a Patreon exclusive perk starting October 1st. There you go. Yeah. And again, um, not really the way we wish to go, but, uh, if anyone out there has made content before they understand how much time goes into it, if you haven't even just piling up just start doing the math on how much we're releasing and, and know that there's a lot of behind the scenes stuff that goes into it. We're not in this to make money, but one thing that has to stop is we need to stop losing money. So uh, yeah, some yes. changes are coming. We apologize. Listen, if you've, if all you've got is comments saying, I don't even want to watch you guys for free. I mean, <laughs> those do make us laugh. Some time it's fine then just shut yeah. her down you're good shut her down it's all good there's lots of other blue jays content that's for free uh there you and go we'll still have oh. lots of free content like yeah. it's not anyways but yes so uh i would say though the feedback that we've received genuinely or generally has been positive so far so uh the patreon it's going well. it's going well that have joined the patreon and we really do appreciate it yeah. i know that People are nickel di and diamond everyone at every little turn. Nowadays, there's about a thousand streaming services. And I know that an extra four bucks a month is a pain. And all we hope is that we're providing enough of a product that you can justify it. And if not, you know what? Like, again, hopefully you still watch the walk off and the free content that we do provide. We had been getting messages asking us to do uh, live streaming the games again which Scott and I did enjoy doing, but boy, is it surprising how much work goes into that and yeah. how much of a, a commitment that is. So reluctantly, we did create a Patreon tier that we thought we would price out of everybody's reach so that nobody would actually uh, yeah. subscribe to that one and then we wouldn't have to do it. Uh, and but we've had we did a few one. people call our people are, on this. Yeah. People are already uh, joining it, so... Yeah, Just so. if you do head over to our Patreon, there is a $25 uh, tier, which includes everything as well. Uh, we're going to do watch parties for Blue Jays games, uh, but mm -hmm. these will be on Zoom. So it'll be uh, a more intimate connection. Yeah. So, like you know, part. it'll be a dozen of us just watching Blue Jays, talking, yeah. hanging out. So yeah, looking forward to go. that. Uh, there's all sorts of different tiers so that uh, you can find something that fits your price range if this is, you know, supporting the channel is something you want to do and uh if not that's fine last thing before we move on i do wish to just plug baseball town one last time okay so we have from the toronto blue jays coming down to the comedy bar sunday comedy bar danforth in toronto we have jay jackson and babe davis schneider coming down and that's not it We've got our Blue Jays insiders joining us for a panel as well. Blake Murphy from Jays Talk Plus and Sportsnet. Julia Cruz from MLB.com. Johnny G 
from gate 14. And of course, our long toss veteran baseball Jen is also going to be there. We're super excited about this. Now, Comedy Bar did reach out last night. They've got one last four pack of tickets to give away here. So what we're going to do, we're not going to do a skill testing question. We're not going to uh, thin the herd. If you would like to come to the show, just drop your comment. You can do so in YouTube. You can reach out. It's it's easier for us if you reach out uh, DMing us on Instagram or on Twitter. So at Walk Off Podcast on Twitter, the Walk Off Podcast on Instagram. Give us your name and that you'd like to come. And those four tickets could be yours. We're going to announce those on Friday. Just a reminder, Andrew McLeod, you are actually the winner of our last giveaway. Now, I've got you on the guest list. Uh, Andrew McLeod times four. You've got four tickets. We have not heard from you yet. So if you are not going to make it, just let us know. You can drop it in the comment section here. I know you're a regular on the YouTube channel. You're always commenting and stuff like that. So congratulations, Andrew. But again, if you can't make it, let us know, and we'll just redraw, and away we go. Okay. Well, let's get into mailbag, bud. Now that we're 11 minutes in, and we've weeded yes. out all the casuals, it's just the diehards left, uh, we're going to start with one from Patreon. Marcus says, not sure if this is even a question for this week's mailbag, but I've started rooting for Vlad to just strike out every time he comes up with less than two outs and a runner on first. Uh, help me? question mark yeah i don't know that's not healthy marcus you don't want to do that <laughs> i feel the same way though like uh he, I, there was uh i can't, can't remember which game it was i think it was against the rockies over the weekend um we had i think like george springer was on third base david schneider at the plate and i felt really good about david schneider scoring him in mm-hmm but I think it was like a full count. And I even just, I turned to my dad and I was like, if Schneider gets walked, Vladdy's going to ground into a double play and the game is over. Like, I don't think that's how it went, but that's how I feel. So like Marcus, yeah. I feel, I can definitely relate to that feeling. of just like, oh, oh, Vladdy. I really hate how much attention has been on Vlad lately it is definitely a little unfair and I know it comes from the expectations that have been put on this man over the time that he's been a Toronto Blue Jay and it comes from past accomplishments wow it yeah. took a second for that to come in and my apologies sometimes my brain in the morning yeah it comes from past accomplishments right it it comes from an expectation of him being the driving cog within this offense and i do kind of feel shitty because i do feel like we were piling on a little bit in long toss on sunday you know you start talking about it and there's six of us and the frustration or i guess there were four of us and the frustration just kind of overboils and i think that maybe we held vlad's feet to the fire a little more than should be deserved because the truth is he's struggling right this is his his worst season since his rookie year and it comes at a time when the expectations were world series or bust for the most part going in so yeah there's a lot of frustrated people with vlad i really think that it is a a misconception that he doesn't give a shit I really think that Vlad does care. And I think that this is eating Vlad up inside. And, and baseball is a sport based on failing, right? Where the, the, the best hitters in the league are still getting out seven out of 10 times to the plate. Like these are the best hitters in baseball that are doing that. So even if you look at Vlad's numbers over the last couple of weeks, they haven't been that bad. He's been one of the top producers. He's not. What's frustrating is that when it feels like the moments are their biggest, he, he does hit into some double plays. And this has been something that has been happening more than normal. And I know that there's even a question about double plays later on in this, in this mailbag that we get to, but I'm with you. I I I'm really rooting the rat Vlad can turn it around. I I don't honestly believe that when he does it, it's going to be in 2023. Sure is the Jays desperately need him to, but I 
he hasn't given any reason to believe. So I well, get it. I get the sentiment of of when Vlad comes up, you almost expect him to get out in an inopportune time. Well, the positivity angle, um, and we touched on this last week, I think we compared Vlad's recent stretch to the same time of year for Bo last season leading into September Bo. And they were eerily similar. Um, Vlad is heating up. So as, as much as he has been nothing short of a major disappointment this season, the last two weeks, yeah, he's hitting 305, slugging 509. It's good for an OPS of almost 900. Uh, with three home runs, that's, three I know, years. small sample size, put the asterisk there if you want, but I mean, three home runs in 14 games, that's a 35 home run pace uh, for a full season. So the takeaway here is he's heating up when we need him to heat up. Mm-hmm. Hopefully he can hit 480 through September now, <laughs> like mm-hmm. Bo did for us last year, but I mean, and I think people forget how much heat Bo Bichette was getting last year. Bo Bichette was literally the dude we talked about ad nauseum like we are Vlad this year. Yep. And look at where Bo is. So to just write off a 24-year-old, I mean, w- we did that last year and had to eat our words. So here we are again, and fingers crossed that we're doing the same thing. Listen, I really don't think Vlad is as bad as he has as looked this season. He's just not. And I know there's all sorts of little caveats you can give about, yes, his his best year was when he was hitting in minor league parks. And maybe if you, you take that sample size out, he is what he is. But even if you go with that, he's he's doing far below what he is, what he is currently in 2023. So I think there is a correction coming. I just really hope that he can continue to build off this two week span. And it is this season. Uh, by the way, Bo Bichette hit 406 in September last year with seven home runs. Again, 35 home run pace, by the way. Um, as of August 31st, he was hitting 260. So, yep. guys can get hot. Hopefully that's what we're seeing out of Laddie heating up at the right time. Uh, and if that's the case, man, if we can make a playoff spot and Vladdy's hitting... 350 plus I like our chances yeah man me too and and the truth is pitching is healthy like let's go it's tough on Vlad bud because the spotlight's on him every every play he makes there's a a microscope on him and it's because he's been struggling so everyone's like oh god God, is it gonna happen again every mistake that happens is magnified everything that goes wrong every double play he hits into seems there's because the narrative has been built right Mm -hmm. even if even if the numbers aren't really fitting into that narrative anymore when you see some of those old problems poking their head up again it's easy to just clump it all together but vlad's on Mm -hmm. his way out fingers crossed (sighs) okay uh trevor calgary on twitter dm'd us and said just listening to long toss now uh on the youtube side and these triple a players are a mirage check out bgo's first two seasons will davis schneider really be better than espy probably but we should enjoy these absurd numbers while it lasts in my view okay so i i i do agree with this there is no way that what we are seeing out of Ernie Clement, Spencer Horwitz, Davis Schneider carries on for the extent of their careers. Uh, expecting what we have seen out of their debuts would be ridiculous. Uh, Ernie Clement currently hitting over 400 since coming into Major League Baseball. Uh, same goes Davis Schneider's just under 400, and I think Spencer Horowitz about the same. All three of them have completely uh, exceeded expectations for guys just getting their feet wet at the major league uh, at the major league level. 
That said, there is a lot of reasons to be hopeful, especially with Spencer Horowitz and Davis Schneider moving forward. Both of them have an incredibly good eye at the plate, have incredibly good bat-to-ball skill, and seem to fit into roles that are needed come 2024. And I think we're going to see both of those guys get a shot. Ernie Clement, a little bit older, 27 years old. He may just be a guy we see going elsewhere in the offseason, whether it's traded or designated for assignment. Someone else picks him up off of the waiver wire. He's kind of that 26 man in the rotation type of dude. And he has got his shot because of injuries and he's taken advantage of it and he's looked really good. So I get what, I get what Trevor's saying with, this is a bit of a mirage, Adam. I mean, you yeah, know, it's, this isn't breaking news that 400 is a hard batting average to maintain. Uh, ask Louis Arias how his batting average is doing. Yeah. Uh, not too many articles on MLB.com asking if uh, he can keep this 400 batting average going anymore as he's currently at, uh, 356 I think think right now so he was at 401 on June 24th June 25th he was at 399 has not been above 400 since in the last nine weeks he has a batting average of 305 still really good uh but he has cooled off the last since August 1st batting average 276 yeah um one thing Trevor said that that does stand out to me is but we should enjoy it while it lasts because <laughs> we should john schneider hey put davis in let's enjoy his hot bat while it's hot and when you hear the sports net guys like listen the the rogers guys are are honestly pretty objective for the most part but they do skew towards the team's view i mean rogers owns both the media outlet and the team there's obviously going to be some crossover there. But when you hear Caleb Joseph and Jamie Campbell both coming out and being like, what the hell is going on with this lineup? Why are they not riding the hot bat? You know that it's a weird decision. And when you look at a guy like Davis Schneider and even his numbers against lefties, why is he the guy getting pulled there? I don't know. But you know what? Yeah. A 6-5 yeah. win is a 6-5 win, even if it wound up being in extra innings against the worst team in the league. What did Jamie Cowell say John Schneider said about sitting Davis or sitting Davis Schneider because what the analytics point to yeah. whatever? Like I get, I mean, yeah, I, I don't know what analytics he's looking at. I'm, I'm looking at the platoons right now. I mean, sure. He's hitting better against lefties than he is against righties, but he's still hitting 380 fucking two against righties. <laughs> You know, his his OPS, like his slugging percentage against righties is 700. Um, A lot of guys would salivate to have their OPS be as good as that. Like, what? And what? I mean, Horowitz played great. Horowitz was great yesterday and definitely came sure. up big. When, Take out when Dalton Varsho. I love Dalton Varsho. Take him out. We don't need him in there right now. I don't know what the right answer is, but give, put wit. Give Witt a day off. Let's rest the guys that are hitting 280, 270, 250. And I know ride the hot hand at this point. Come on. You know what? And this is what the Blue Jays farm system needed. You're starting to see the Blue Jays fan base have a little bit more hope in some of these AAA players, especially after we the success we've seen out of out of Spencer and Davis and and Ernie. There's there's folks that are like, let Kiermeyer go, let Belt go, let Chapman go. Uh, let Wit go and let's let's get Addison Barger or Elvis Martinez, Davis Schneider, and Spencer Horowitz up. Can you see that happening? Is that too much of a youth infusion and too many variables that can go wrong? Wait, what's your question? Are we letting those guys go I'm just this saying, off for season? So. For in twenty twenty four, let Ernie Clement you, leave. Would you be would you be comfortable with uh, Whit Merrifield? All of all of the free agents, Whit, Whit Kiermaier, Merrifield, Belt, Chapman, Chapman gone, Kiermaier, all gone, and replacing them with Aralvis Martinez, Spencer Horowitz, Davis Schneider, Addison, and Addison Barger. Barger. That feels like a massive rebuild. Much. 
it feels yeah, too much. That, that's ugly. Now, that's... two of those four, two of those four I love. I don't if even it... know. I don't even love two of those four. Oh. Who, which two? Because Okay, this is where I'm like with Trevor on the, these numbers are mirage. Love David Schneider. Love what he's doing. He's absolutely what the team needed right now. And with Bo on the IL and like, we needed some guys to step up from out of the shadows and they're absolutely filling in. This is all we could ask for. But do I want to see 160 games out of David Schneider at all next year? Blech. No, thanks. No, thanks. I think he's earned the right. I think he's earned the right to get a legitimate shot. I think he earned. I think he's earned an invitation to the big league spring training camp. That's all. He's earned in my books. Yeah. Like, I don't think we should be penciling in our offseason plans around. Well, we at least we have Davis Schneider as our second baseman or as our whatever baseman for next. Season. Like, I don't like that at all. I don't. For any of those it's, guys. It's asking a lot. It's asking a lot. Out of guys with very, very limited big league experience. If we weren't supposed to be competing, it'd be a different story. Of course, if this was like if we were the 2022 Baltimore Orioles and it was like or the 2019 Toronto Blue Jays where it's like, hey, we got Bowen Vladdy coming up this year and hey, David Schneider looks hot at second base. Like, I like sure, that. Br bring all six if, of them up. But if this was the 2022 Baltimore Orioles or the 2021 Baltimore Orioles or the 2019 Baltimore Orioles or the 2018 Baltimore Orioles. Sure. Right. You run them out. <laughs> I, I think they are going to use some of this depth to replace some of these guys, but I think they are going to be a little bit more picky about who how they go about doing this. I don't think that this is going to be quite the uh, Toronto Bisons that we've seen so far in September. So Look, it's going to be curious this... to see how it goes. <clears throat> As much as Davis Schneider has been white hot since coming up, and yeah, Ernie Clement, like you said, hitting 400, and Spencer Horowitz looks very competent on both sides of the ball right now. The ceiling on them for their career trajectory is not first ballot Hall of Famer. No. That's what it was for Vlad and for Bo. Like when they're 20 in AAA, hitting 385, and you go, yeah, this guy, like, if things go right, Hall of Fame yeah. potential here, right? That's the ceiling on these guys. It's okay to bring those guys up when they're 20 and 21 years old and go, okay, yeah, let's let's throw them in with the men and let's let's really challenge them and, and, and get things going. You don't need to do that with Addison Barger. Like, w let's let these guys struggle in the minors and figure out how to get out of a slump and, and, and not rush the process. I mean, we're going to talk Alec Manoa towards the end of the episode yeesh pull my collar on that one yeah but like this is the argument against bringing up the young guys right is that they haven't had that chance to really struggle to really face adversity to figure out how to slump bust to you know like to go through all that do we want to bring up addison barger at, only to demote him a year later and then have him refuse to report to trip sorry i'm getting yeah getting flustered here scott but i'm not in a rush to see addison barger as our starting third baseman next year instead of matt chapman that's all I, have. I don't even know if I particularly would like to see Matt Chapman back. Although, honestly, what he does at defense, I know folks constantly point at all his errors this year. But Kevin Biggio's look pretty good at third. Kevin Biggio has been an absolute dream this season. The versatility that has always been his big draw point you know his big positive point is coming in so handy right now and he made some big time plays at third base i know uh trevor and calgary and i were were chatting a little bit more uh on twitter there than just his question for mailbag and and biggio was one where both of us were like my goodness like that play he made yesterday at third base that pretty much saved the game mm -hmm. prevented a run 
and then just threw it across the field and nailed the guy at first. I mean, we all remember what 2021 was like with him at the Hawk corner. It was a nightmare and seeing him being penciled into third base position scared the shit out of me going Mm -hmm. into yesterday's game. But you know what, man, he definitely held his ground, man. He showed up big. All you can ask from a dude who's being put in that situation. Like, it's not ideal, right? What's going on right now with all these regulars being injured and need to, you know, shuffle through all of our bench pieces and AAA guys? It's not ideal, but the guys have stepped up. I remember, I think it was opening day this year. You read me like the, the opening day lineup for the Blue Jays in like 2018 or something. Mm-hmm. And just how hilarious all those names were. That's kind of how I feel right now when I look at the today's yeah. starting lineup and it's like Ernie Clement. What? Yeah. <laughs> Where's like Bo's gone. Danny's down the eye. Oh, Danny Jansen. His hand if got you, chopped off. If you read, damn it. If you read, if you read today's lineup off to me uh, uh, in April and told me we were half a game back of a wild card, I'd be like, what has happened? Yeah. What is going on? <laughs> Wild. Oh, man. Wild All right. Um, Johnny Eaton DM'd us on Patreon. Says, hey, fellas. So John Schneider seems to let his past experience clout his judgment. Cloud his judgment. There have been several times that Kikuchi or Ryu has been dealing. And he's pulled them early. And then the opposite has been true for Gossman, Bassett, Brios, and Manoa at times. Just too many moves without any quality explanation for them. Like the old school manager m- mistake was, well, I put our best guy out there and it just didn't pan out. But these days it's more like, well, I pulled our best guy because some analytics told us that in a tiny sample size, one of our worst guys would actually be our best guy. I kind can of you answer that. that? I can hear my dog tearing apart my kitchen right now. So I got to yes, go. You go, you go okay. save your kitchen, Adam. Okay. So I do like the way he put that, that last sentence, which is kind of the change and the shift in baseball in general over the last decade, which, you know, you go with your horses used to be kind of the general consensus amongst managers, right? You go with the guy that's the stud. You go with your best player in the hardest situation. And analytics have honestly changed that substantially, right? Where there's just a lot of evidence sometimes that line up with doing what Johnny just said, which is removing your go-to guy for someone that if you just look at their numbers is a, a lesser player. It's you can rip apart managers on any team. We always go through this. John Schneider is at the end of his rope in my books. I've been frustrated with him and some of the moves that he has made. I don't see him being the guy taking this team to the promised land. Who knows? I hope I'm wrong. I hope I'm wrong. I hope that oh. they manage to to squeak into the playoffs and go on a real run and and I'm apologizing apologizing to John Schneider and Ross Atkins and the whole crew by the end of the year. But yeah, and it's it, it has been interesting. Even yesterday, Jose Barrios at 84 pitches got pulled from the game after using a plethora of pitchers in that rain delay bullpen extravaganza in the last game of the Colorado series. I was a little surprised to see them pull Jose Barrios with so much left in the tank. You can always question these moves for two more innings until uh, 110 pitches and he gives up one late and everyone's questioning the same thing. But yeah, I kind of do agree with Johnny in that it has been odd to watch John Schneider so often go to the analytics rather than go with the guy who is the best player. Which yeah. we watched yesterday with David Schneider not getting put into the game. <laughs> I just wish I had a more definitive answer on who to point the finger at. Yeah. I just, the way like sports are run these days and it is such an analytics department, it's like, 
Is it even his call? Like, I, I really, if it's not, I sure have a hard time giving him shit when he's like, maybe he's getting a phone call and he's like, are you fucking kidding me? We're sitting Davis Schneider today. We're not sitting Davis Schneider. He's fucking hitting a million right now. And they're like, no, you have to sit him because blah, blah, blah. And what is he going to do? Right? If his hands are tied, I mean, his hands maybe, are tied. So like, Maybe that's why he has the job. Right? The, I know. He's the guy who's prepared to, to go with the plan the front office has laid out. Listen, John Schneider is not the only manager in Blue Jays history to be that guy, right? John Gibbons was hired from Alex Anthopoulos' um, regime, mm -hmm. which was originally because Anthopoulos trusted him from the J.P. Richardi regime when Anthopoulos was coming up through the front office ranks. Mm -hmm. So sometimes it's about having trust in the guy to just do your plan, mm -hmm. and maybe that's what we're watching. Ross Atkins calling John Schneider and saying, do you really think you're smarter than these seven guys and gals in khakis that I've hired? Yeah. You play yeah. Scott Haddenberg at first. Haddenberg at first. <laughs> Chat GPT told me, sit David Schneider. So do it. <laughs> Chat GPT yeah. now running the Toronto Blue Jays. That's the real manager. <laughs> exactly. All right. Um... Maggie Stewart says, hey, guys, love the pod. Keep up the great work. Seems like lately the Blue Jays keep having their rallies killed by double plays. We kind of touched on this earlier. Uh, I don't know if there's a stat for this, but there should be. So first of all, Maggie, love this question because you made me do some research here. Um, and it's funny when questions like this come up because there's so many times where you start looking into the number and how it feels is wrong. But Maggie, that is not, this is not one of those times. Okay, so there's been 11 ground into double plays for the Jays since the start of the National Series. During that time, the Blue Jays opponents have hit into three. Now, I, I was trying to find how many double plays are hit on average in a season, and the best I could do was I found it for 2016. My guess is it's probably fairly comparable. So in 2016, teams completed an average of 145 double plays over 162. So just under a double play a game. Start doing the math. Obviously, 11 double plays in seven games is far and uh, way above the average here, almost double. So yes, over the last seven days, you are right, Maggie. There has been a lot of rally killers because Blue Jays are hitting into double plays. That isn't just a feeling. That is fact. I don't have any positive spin to put on that as hard as I might try. No positive spin to put on double grounding into double plays to end a rally. That is the worst case scenario. And this is where some of the negativity from Vlad has come from. I know he's responsible for a couple of those in some big moments. Um, I can't find it now. I'm looking for it. But and I know they mentioned this on the broadcast the other day. You said uh, the yeah. Blue Jays. Since August second, so in the in the last month, led all of baseball uh, in batting average with runners in scoring position. It's like the a three forty seven average. That's good. So yeah. there we go. Okay. Um, next one. Question for mailbag. This one's from. Johnny on Patreon says, uh, ahead of next season, there aren't too many players coming off of good seasons that are worth it for the Blue Jays to trade. Uh, the free agents can walk, and most of those roles can be filled internally, thank goodness. But what do you think of trading Yusei Kikuchi and his $10 million contract after a career best year? So this is a really interesting question. Obviously, it will really depend where the front office decides to go in the off season. And I think that moving a guy when their value is at the highest is never necessarily a bad move. 
There are a lot of moving parts that will determine if this is an option at all. Alec Manoa being one of the big ones and how they decide to go about uh, the Hinge and Ryu free agency. Do they bring back the big Korean monster or do they let him go? Are they going to pick up a bottom of the rotation starter? There's a lot of questions that need to be answered before. Will they consider a move of Yusei Kikuchi? Now, Yusei Kikuchi, what he has done for this Toronto Blue Jays team, I don't even wish to imagine where this team would be without him in 2023, especially with the complete dissension of Alec Manoa and him blowing up. Because Kikuchi has filled in incredibly admirably. He is pushing 150 innings pitched. He has an ERA under four. He has improved as the season's gone on, which Adam is something that he has never done in his MLB career. In fact, he's had very good starts to seasons before. He has given hope to other organizations that he can put it together and has never quite been able to do so. I think it's safe to say he's pulled that off this year. Mm-hmm. And so like, like Johnny said, his His value is at an all-time high. It would be like moving Alejandro Kirk at the deadline last year. And we have watched some of these guys that had major value lose their value. Guys like Espinal and Kirk that maybe they should have considered moving. I mean, hindsight's 2020, right? But here, okay. So here's here's the question. Now that you bring up Alejandro Kirk, trade him at the deadline last year because I was calling for that. I was calling for that last July. It depends on, and now I hear my dog scratching at my door. By the way, it wasn't my dog tearing apart my kitchen. It was my dad making toast. So <laughs> does that does that count as my food reference for the day? Oh. Um, anyways, um, he's so apologetic. Oh, sorry. Are you recording? But I, am I making too much? He's such a sweetheart. Anyways. Yeah. Um, it's, yes. Do you sell at a, a guy's high? I would say this is probably you say Kikuchi's best season we can ever hope to have out of him maybe i have more hope that you say is who he is now but we'll see yeah but i still think i don't think he ever has numbers better than this i mean you can have slightly worse seasons and not be worthless to the blue jays oh yeah um whereas alejandro kirk and i know that's not where he's at i know he's been a serviceable catcher yes for us but my and argument for trading him last year was that I still think his long-term career trajectory is going to get bad sooner than later. Yusei Kikuchi, I don't know. I guess it depends what you can get back, like you said, and what the rest of the starting rotation looks like. Um if if there was a universe in which we could have a reunion with Ryu or keep Kikuchi. No, oh, how do I word this? If there's two timelines, one timeline is we trade away Yusei Kikuchi in his last year of the deal, and then we give money to Ryu and keep Ryu. Or the other option is we let Ryu walk and we keep Kikuchi think i'd rather have ryu i'd rather the timeline in which we re-up with ryu and trade away you say kikuchi how do you feel about that if those if those are the two options so Who number one have? grounds crew members i'd love to hear your thoughts on this if you had to pick one or the other kikuchi or ryu to return next year who are you choosing uh personally i i I don't think it has to be one or the other. I really do think that it there does. Is a this third, is my hypothetical. I'm, I'm, I'm giving you. No, okay. Give me the third timeline. You there's weasel. A third timeline where they both come back, but no. If, well, yeah, if of it, course. If, if this scenario in this scenario where you're giving, I think I'd rather you say Kikuchi. I, I do think that um, he has this in him again. I, I, I honestly believe Ryu is is who he is right now too. And I think that he is a guy that at 35 years old can still succeed with his repertoire and his arsenal. 
arsenal and the fact he's never been a velo driven pitcher and the fact that he has hit his spot so crazy well this year like since coming back from tommy john's surgery the guy he's in the best shape of his life and has pitched like the Ryu of 2020 that led this team to the to the playoffs for the first time since 2016 so uh yeah but i i do think i guess if i have to pick probably yusei kikuchi you'd rather have yusei kikuchi than ryu i think so yes okay wow because you're a big Ryu guy. You, I didn't see you that know coming. I love Ryu. Oh, yeah, I love Ryu. Totally. I absolutely love Ryu. Okay, here's a fourth scenario, a fourth timeline. The 26-man roster in its entirety is on an airplane. Plane's going down. There's 26 parachutes. One bag doesn't have a parachute in it. It has dirty dishes. Who are you giving the dirty dishes to? Go. Okay, don't answer that. Don't answer that. Uh, that got weird. Uh, that got weird. <laughs> let's move on. Let's, oh, let's man, that's on. DFA to a whole new level. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah, it sure is. Uh, okay. Uh, this is a Discord Patreon clarification question. So Scott messaged us on Patreon. Uh, he also messaged us in the Discord for clarification. Uh, but on the Patreon, he says, Hey guys, just joined up and would like to secure my Discord membership and get that sweet yellow name bar. Uh, I am Scott Adams, the Jays fan on Discord, by the way. And yes, that is a troll name that made me giggle. So <laughs> last name is not Adams. That's something that you and I have been questioning for years now. Yeah, we've been questioning this for literally two years, Scott Adams, the Jays fan. <laughs> um, okay, so basically the way that this will work is you do got to get your ducks in a row to uh, link your discord account with your patreon account if you sign up for the patreon there is an option there to link your accounts um, if you're having troubles finding that shoot me a message directly and i'll help you walk through the steps i know some people were saying that they've had old email addresses hacked that they no longer have access to and stuff like that i don't have a good answer for you other than like you might have to make a new Discord account and and link that one with Patreon. But if you had your email hacked anyways, you should probably sort that out. Um, there's not really going to be a way around this. As of October 1st, um, it's going to be managed by the site itself. Patreon. So they are integrated uh, platforms. The Discord and the Patreon are linked. And basically... It is going to keep track of all the who has access, who doesn't. So if you are a Patreon member and you've been paying your dues, you will automatically have access to the Discord if your account is linked. Um, if you stop paying for a month, the app will automatically uh, remove your access to the Discord. And then if you re-up, it will automatically grant you access just otherwise, it's up to me to do it manually, and I'm not checking the list 30 times a month to see, well, who signed up on the 14th, and whose subscription yeah. expired on the 17th, and who do I got to remove, and I'm not dealing with any of that. So if you're having troubles linking your accounts, by all means, I will hop on a phone call with you, and we'll try and sort it out. But uh, it is something that is going to just be needed to be resolved. So again, you've got three and a half weeks to uh, make up your decision. And if you can't do it, that's, that's totally cool. Uh, still join us in the comment section on YouTube and uh, add your friends from discord, get their phone numbers or emails, whatever. That's that. Did I do, did I do good? You nailed it, buddy. Thank you. Better than I could have. All right. Uh, last one here. Okay. Before we do the last one, okay. I do have one. That's just a quick little fun one that I think, Please. uh, okay. will, will maybe get a laugh here. So okay. Christopher keeping, uh, messaged us and was just like, my God, Jordan Romano constantly keeps things entertaining, maybe even more entertaining than Ray Romano. So Deborah, right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Everybody loves Ray. Yeah, uh, there are two. Do you watch Everybody Loves Raymond when it was on, like in I, the nineties? I mean, okay. So 
Was I Let's a huge fan of Everybody Loves Raymond? No, not really. Was it on constantly on syndication and you couldn't turn TV on without it being on? Mm. Absolutely. And I would sit and watch it sometimes. In fact, sometimes even when I'm on the road for comedy, you know, you come home at midnight and turn it on and everybody loves Raymond's on for like four hours that night. And yeah, sometimes I'll wind up watching it. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Uh, you? I, I watched it quite. I wouldn't say I, like I've watched every episode of Seinfeld dozens of times. Yes. Every episode of The Office, hundreds of times. I I I bet you I've seen 90% of the Everybody Loves Raymond episodes once. Mm -hmm. I'm probably the same. Probably haven't seen them all. I will say his wife Deborah, in my mm -hmm. opinion, the original MILF. I had a crush on her as a kid that I cannot explain. Uh yeah. <laughs> we'll leave it at that. Um two moments from that show that have always stuck out to me. One was a scene in which uh, Ray pretended to be bad at loading the dishwasher so that Deborah would just stop asking him to do it. And it was one less yeah. chore for him to do. So he was intentionally bad at chores to get out of them, which to this day is a trick I still use sometimes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean? Don't mix your whites with your colors for laundry. Um, and then the other one was him pointing out that he can call his wife whatever terrible name he wants as long as he says it in like a nice upbeat tone of voice and he's like oh, oh you're such a smelly tramp or whatever yeah. it's just like I, I don't know this is anyways we've gone totally off the rails here um <laughs> all, all right, right. Let's um, get to the last one let's here. get to the last one here. long in the teeth yeah so Ian posted in Discord uh, this Ben Nicholson Smith tweet about Alec Manoa being removed from the active roster in AAA. Uh, that's not good. Yeah, the, the Bisons placed Alec Manoa on temporarily inactive list yesterday per minor league baseball. If a minor league player is away from a team for a few days because of a personal matter, travel to an all-star game, etc., and not placed on the LIL, he is placed on the temporary inactive list. Alec Manoa is still with the AAA Bisons per source. This move freed up a AAA roster spot while he is while he builds back up okay is this a big deal is this not a big deal how do you feel about all of this alec manoa stuff i think it's a bigger deal than it's being let on it is i think something's going on i don't know what it is obviously this is behind closed doors but uh yeah there's some definite red flags going on with alec manoa my friend we are 52 and a half minutes into this episode, so I feel safe about burying this hot take this late, and I promise I won't put it in the thumbnail unless you clicked on this video because it was in the thumbnail, then shut up. Um, <laughs> but my genuine feeling out of all of this is that he's pitched his last game for the Blue Jays organization. I'm 10 out of 10 disturbed by this last month of development in Alec Manoa. I'm not putting blame on Alec Manoa. I don't know the full story yet, but mm -hmm. it does not seem like this is a amicable relationship. And I mean, I don't have confidence in this front office to repair a damaged relationship. I don't know why. I just don't. This is a way bigger deal than maybe is being led on because well, this okay. pitching staff, this pitching staff has picked up the team so well after the face plant that has been the 2023 season of Alec Manoa. And it's easy to maybe be like, you know what? We're fine. But this is a guy who finished third in Cy Young voting in the American League last year. Just last year. Like literally not even 12 months ago. And now. Adam is predicting he might never pitch with this Blue Jays team again. And there is a reason that this is your prediction. So, this okay. Tweet that you Hold found, on. Right. Before we get to that, I just want to point out his game logs uh, pre and post demotion. So when he got demoted, 
um, what was it, in June? June 5th, looks like his last game at the Major League level. Had an ERA of 6.36. Um, he was struggling to get out of the early innings. It, w- it was not good. Uh, he came back, which we all thought was probably too early when he did. But he never really had a terrible outing in the six starts since he came back. Like His first game was against Detroit, uh, one earned run over six innings. His second game was against the Padres. This one wasn't so good. Four earned runs over three. Uh, but otherwise, it was three earned runs he pitched into the sixth inning. Uh, one earned run he pitched into the fifth inning. Uh, three earned runs he pitched into the seventh inning. Uh, four earned runs pitched into the fifth inning. And then he got demoted again. Um, Ryu was back and healthy and was showing that he is a more than good enough fifth starter. Um, we probably didn't need a six starter who has given us a high fours to be generous ERA. Yes. But like to put my feet in Alec Manoa's shoes in that spot, I could see where he felt like, yeah, when I'm pitching a six and a half ERA, demote me. I get it. But like I came back and I wasn't that bad. Like I had one bad outing out of six and the rest were like, good enough to not get sent back down to triple a so like i could understand where he would be frustrated frustrated um so here's a message that i found that is not getting enough attention um i sent this to you but it was in a believe it or not a blue so when i describe this message it's going to sound really hokey and like illegitimate well i'll give you context for it so Uh, Danny Gallagher posted in a Toronto Blue Jays Facebook fan page some insight into what's going on with Alec Manoa. And this was a couple weeks ago, um, but it's relevant again. So I'm like, who the hell is Danny Gallagher? So I look into Danny Gallagher. He is a Montreal Expos historian. He has like nine written books. um, More legitimate of a baseball source than either of you or I. He is not a sports net insider, but knows his way around and baseball and is and absolutely you can question his sources, but totally. he's also not a nobody. He's not a nobody. I have poured through his Twitter timeline. There don't seem to be any tweets that are hot takey clickbait trying to just go viral for for no reason so i'm going to again this is just me personally saying i'm going to lend credibility to danny gallagher uh in my interpretation of what he says you guys can parse through it and and dismiss it how you see fit um but his post in this facebook group was i've been told alec manoa was not given mlb pay or service time during the 14 day window when he underwent quote unquote medical tests in Toronto earlier in August, that was following his second demotion. That was when he was demoted to Buffalo, but like reports were coming out from the the sports net crew. He's still in Toronto. We don't know what's going on. He's being evaluated for medical stuff. Well, Danny Gallagher is reporting that not getting paid for that time, not getting service time. If this was a team sanctioned, medical evaluation that was going on he'd be getting paid for it and he'd be getting service time um it says this was after he was optioned to buffalo august 11th uh reached out to his agent jeff randazzo and he didn't get back to me and then says reached out to the mlbpa for comment and their response was quote we are going to be a no comment on this um a few days ago, Manoa finally reported to Buffalo. This whole scenario has been fuzzy slash secretive, to say the least. I was told lawyers were involved, along with medical professionals. Just hoping the big guy gets his act together and returns to the Jays at some point. So, now he's reported to Buffalo. Now he's on the inactive list? This, like, non-injured inactive Another- list while he builds back up? Like... I don't know. This just feels like all all the language we're getting out of John Schneider, Ross Atkins, 
and all of the front the front facing Sportsnet crew feels like to me crisis management. We don't want a distraction right now. We do not want to be answering questions about Alec Manoa demanding a request for trade or whatever. We got games that we need to focus on winning. He's not with the team, but things are good, I swear. Right? That's what it feels like to me. So another little caveat here, Adam, when we're talking service time is that when they did send out a, a Alec Manoa back down to the minors in June, it actually reset when his free agency will come around. So it was set for 2028, but because he got moved down, he actually loses a, because he was in the minors for a full month, he loses a year of service time and is now a free agent in 2029. So there might be some legitimate bad blood here that Alec Manoa feels that he has been tampered with when it comes to service time. Now, obviously you look at his performance and as a fan base, it's pretty hard to believe that the blue Jays did anything outside of try to get him right until they sent him down. It, it even felt like maybe they gave him more rope than they should have. That said, we don't know what's going on behind closed doors. And if any of these reports coming from Danny Gallagher are correct, that is a huge red flag flag and does not bode well for the relationship between this Blue Jays front office and Alec Manoa. And we have watched relationships sour in the past between players in this front office and it end terribly. Marcus Stroman comes to mind. Yeah. Um, I don't know, man. This is a tough one. Alec Manoa, by the way, at his all-time lowest for value when it comes to the possibility of moving him out of the organization in a trade. Yeah. Well, this is why I want to put it at the end of the episode. Cause I didn't want to, uh, I didn't want anybody to think we were being clickbaity with our hot takes mm -hmm. and our whatever. I want to bury this as deep in this episode as we can, but I am worried. Everyone in the grounds crew, what are your thoughts on this? And do you take anything this Danny Gallagher has to say as legitimate stuff? Are you concerned about Alec Manoa? Where is everyone's level of panic when it comes to where and how Alec Manoa has been handled by this Blue Jays organization in 2023? It's a pretty big deal to have a guy at the front end of your rotation, your pseudo ace, the guy that everyone has been relying on, the dude who started game one of your playoff round last year, the dude who started your opening day of the season, who did who pitched in your home opener to just fall flat on his face. And now, Adam, you're predicting he never pitches with the Jays again. Like this is this is not good, man. And I think um, the more the Blue Jays can keep a wrap on this, probably the better. But I, I don't want the distractions surprised. either. I, I would not be surprised if come the offseason, some really interesting and really uh, negative stuff comes out about this situation. Um, as that, said, of... that said, this could all be overblown. This could all be speculation. And this could literally just be what we have talked about in the past, which is Alec Manoa was overworked last year. And the only way for him to recover and his body to, to rehab is to shut it down for a while. And that could be all that's happening. Um, Buffalo Bison have, as of today, 18 games left this season. running out of time to even make a start. Well, this is what stood out to me with the, the release from Ben Nicholson Smith, friend of the show is he was like building back up until he builds back up, like building back up to what? That's what I mean. Right. Uh, the Buffalo Bison, by the way, not going to be in the playoffs. They are not a playoff team this year. Yeah, I don't want to see him pitch for the Blue Jays uh, in the postseason at all this year. 
I don't think the Blue Jays wish to see him post or pitch for the. No, like like in, in, unless he had been pitching in Buffalo this whole time and was mm-hmm. looking okay, but even then you go, uh, there's a lot of risk there. You know, you got to go do the risk reward measurement. But as it stands right now, given that he hasn't pitched since what August 10th, it's been almost a full month now. Yeah, build back up for what? To pitch the final week of the AAA season so you can shut them down then? Yeah. Legit. Ooh, it doesn't make so, sense. So I mean, honestly, I uh, outside of what's wrong with Vlad, I think this is the biggest question of the Toronto Blue Jays season is how has Alec Manan, Manoa's and this front office's relationship held up in a very tumultuous time in the kid's career? Uh, I also just want to remind everybody uh, February 24th of this year, uh, Alec Manoa declined the pay raise from the Blue Jays. Mm-hmm. That is the same thing Bo Bichette did. That is the organizational-based pay raise structure, and he opted out of it. Uh, it's the old, it's nothing business, or it's nothing personal, it's just business. Uh, it's posturing for negotiations down the for road. arbitration, yeah. It doesn't indicate it's a strong happy relationship though either does it so frustrations i think um there you go all right let's call it there that is your monday morning mailbag on a tuesday afternoon quick reminder for all of you listening that uh, we really appreciate the grounds crew obviously and you folks in patreon uh the little patreon bump that you get for mailbag, um, a part of a long list of reasons to join Patreon. And again, we do appreciate your generosity. Uh, if you are looking to go to baseball town, we will pin the tickets for that in the comments section. We do have four tickets to give away for Friday. All you need to do is get your name in the draw. Drop us a message saying you would like to go to baseball town. We'll announce the winner on Friday. Andrew McLeod, you've got four tickets already waiting for you. Let us know if you can make it. If not, we will redraw that as well. And Jay Jackson, Davis Schneider coming down. You're going to get to meet a couple Toronto Blue Jays. We've got an incredible panel of guests with Blake Murphy, uh, uh, Blake Murphy, Julia Cruz, baseball, Jen, and of course, Johnny G of Gate 14. Craig Ballard of Locked on Blue Jays is hosting it with me. It is going to be a blast, and it is going to be a Blue Jays-centric event like Toronto hasn't seen in a live setting. So let's let's pack this place out. Again, uh, all you got to do to get tickets is click on the link that's going to be in the comment section or hopefully try and win it. All right, um, everybody. Thanks so much. Cheers. Bye.